ask you all just to bow your heads right now. Father, here we are again with children standing in the need of prayer. We're asking you in a mighty special way, Lord, just to send the Holy Spirit here in a double portion this morning to illuminate our minds and hearts to the blessing that you have in store for all of us here today. As usual, Father, as I preach, I'm for let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let everyone say amen. Now, I've been given the topic dealing with interpersonal relationships. Interpersonal relationships. And those of you who have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me now to the book of St. Matthew. I want to thank Pastor Watkins again for the scripture reading. St. Matthew chapter 5. And I just want to focus in on one particular verse here. Verse 22. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, 
shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever, are you still with me, shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Well, say good morning to my senior pastor too, Pastor Thompson. Good to have you here also. The story is told that a boy once asked his daddy, how do wars begin? His dad told him that World War I began because Germany invaded Belgium. Came into the room and she interrupted the conversation and she said, why don't you tell the boy the truth? World War I began when somebody murdered somebody else. The husband became upset and he threw his hands up in the air and he said to his wife, uh, this conversation is between me and the boy. Why don't you mind your own business? The wife turned her back, her husband, walked out the room, slammed the door, and the dishes fell to the floor. The pictures fell off the wall. When everything was silent, the son turned to his father and he said, Daddy, you don't have to tell me how wars begin. I can see with my own eyes. Anger. Matthew chapter 5, 21 through 26. These were young men. They wanted action. They wanted adventure. Like all young folk, they wanted to be happy. They grew up in this environment when, where there were two things going against them. Their country was occupied by a, of Rome. So there was the ever-present question of the right attitude. Are you still with me? The right attitude towards their enemies. Race prejudice was everywhere. And a person hardly knew who his neighbor, the middle class of people, had almost disappeared. There was only the very rich and the poor. Number two, there was the problem of religion. The Pharisees believed that if you live a clean, and pure and righteous life as defined by the rabbis I'm coming back to that one and if you trusted in God God would do all the rest they thought the Pharisees that salvation was only for them but Jesus came along and Jesus tried to show them that salvation is like the sunshine. It belongs to everybody. Come on, say amen out there. Jesus tried to show them that the religion of the Bible was not to be the covers of a book. Jesus tried to show them uh, that the church was not just uh, some four walls just on the Sabbath. Religion is not to be brought out uh, occasionally just uh, for somebody to see how you live. But religion was to be an inward experience. Stay with me now. The Jews believed that life, and they thought that God was a slavish God. They believed that God was strict. They believed that God was a severe taskmaster who would not have no deviation from the straight line of the law. But Jesus came along. And Jesus rejected the Pharisees' interpretation of the law. Say amen out there. But the dilemma here is no one has the right 
to come to you to tell you to change your way of living unless they have a better way to offer you. Show amen out there. Now I'm trying to set this thing up. Jesus taught that forsaking the wrong way is only half of repentance. Jesus taught not only must you stop doing wrong, but you must start doing right. Come on, say amen. The Pharisees were going around trying to establish their own righteousness. Rather than living by faith in the living God, it's customs and traditions and creeds in addition to God's law. Are you still with me? They tried to make themselves acceptable in the sight of God. But I'm here to tell you today that human effort, no matter how sincere you think you are, can never substitute for the goodness that God offers to me and you. Come on, say amen. Let me give you a few words about the sermon itself. It is recorded in Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7. And Dr. Luke records it in St. Luke chapter 17 through 49. Some folk feel that the sermon really was not a sermon. But a number of sayings that people collected and put together. But I'm foolish enough to believe that whenever Jesus spoke that we better listen. Come on, say amen out there. This sermon is called the Sermon on the Mount because my Jesus spoke it on a hillside near Capernaum. Enormous crop Jesus, wherever he went. He was the talk of the town, wherever he went. Everyone wanted to see Jesus. And this day was no exception. Now let me pause here for a minute. Whenever there is a crowd, that does not mean that everyone in the crowd is converted. Come on, come on now. You see, in that crowd, day of the Jesus, there were some experts. There were some experts who, who had the notion of going around telling other folk how they should live. So my Jesus, let it be known that obeying God's law, stay with me, obeying God's law is more important than trying to explain God's law. It's the truth. Some in the crowd were content to obey the law outwardly without letting the Holy Ghost permeate their lives inwardly. Some in the crowd were pious but they were far away from God. But I'm so glad that my Jesus judges my heart. My Jesus knows what's on the inside. We've got to be concerned about our attitudes which people don't see. Say amen out there. Jesus understood that a man would never solve the problem of moral behavior by changing outward rules. There's got to be an inward change for an outward change. A heart transplant, if you please. All the education you get if you don't have Jesus will only make you an educated sinner. Oh, but what arrested my attention were the words in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 5. You see, Jesus knew the heart. Those Pharisees prided themselves in their own self-righteousness. Jesus was saying that uh, to his listeners that they not only needed a different kind of goodness altogether from seeds, they needed Holy Ghost power. Jesus said in verse 20, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what are you saying, Jesus? I'm glad you asked. Our goodness must come from what 
God does in us. Come on, say amen. Our goodness is but God-centered. Our goodness is based on reverence for God, not approval from men. You've got to go beyond just the keeping of the law. You've got to live by the principles of the law. Say amen. I read that the rich young ruler had that problem. He had been brought up in the church from his youth up. But one day, he met Jesus. Good master, how will I e e inherit eternal life? Jesus said, well, wait a minute. You kept the commandments from your youth up. You told me that. But I want you to sell what you have and give to the poor. And the man, the by sorrowing, and we can assume therefore safely, he will wind up in hell. He did not love his neighbor. And that's all he had. He had the commandments without Jesus. Oh, I'm coming back to that. Y'all didn't get that. He did not allow the love of God to reach down into his very pits of his soul. He was more concerned about being righteous in the eyes of the people than allowing God to change his heart. Shame in out there. Now, Jesus said, I don't want to rush this thing. Jesus said in verse 21, Ye have heard, are y'all reading with me, that it was said by the old time, Thou shalt not kill, but I, say unto you wait a minute jesus who in the world do you think you are are you above the law what gives you the right to tell us uh, i say unto you what these folk didn't realize that in their very presence was somebody who was the author of the law say amen out there somebody who had written the law with his own finger Somebody who knew the secrets of the heart. Somebody who knew every thought, every purpose, every plan, every mo That's who I am. So I say unto you, I haven't come here to set aside the requirements of my law. I haven't come here to change the law. Heaven and earth pass away. Not one jot, no one tittle shall pass away from my law. After all, it was I who gave both the moral and the ceremonial law to Moses. I haven't come here to destroy the confidence in my own instruction. I've come here to break down the barrier that you have set up between the people and God. You are the ones who've got the people in the mess anyhow with your own man-made. In verse 21 of Matthew, you have heard implying that the majority of the audience that day had not read the law for themselves. So they were just the hearers of the law and not the doers of the law. Come on, shame man out there. You see, it's bad to go on hearsay. You've got to experience the word for yourself. Mama can't do it for you. Daddy can't do it for you. The preacher can't do it for you. You've got to experience the word for yourself. Didn't Paul tell Timothy, study to show thyself improved unto God? Life on this earth is not some script that we're following. It's a life or death matter. You cannot serve two masters. You've got to hold on to one and let go of the other. Starting to feel all right up here now. Jesus. Oh yeah, Jesus. The fuller understanding of why he gave the law on Mount Sinai. Ye have heard from the law. Thou shalt not kill but I saying unto you that everyone who has an attitude of anger toward his brother shall be in danger of the judgment and whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger 
of the council. Now sit up, y'all. Sit up now. May I take this off? All right. Oh, he's moving. <laughs> Why are you fighting? <laughs> These verses are fairly clear, except for the name calling. Preacher, what does Raka mean? I'm glad you asked. The word Raka is an effort to give the sound of a When a Jew wanted to express his utter contempt for another person, he would spit on him. Usually in his face. This was considered about the meanest thing you could do to a brother or sister. The word raka also is a transliteration of the Arabic word which means stupid. You better watch how you call names. Oh, I can't rush this thing, Pastor Thompson. It is an expression of strong contempt. When one loses respect for another brother or sister, Jesus is saying here that murder really begins in the heart. When another person loses respect for his brother or sister. Come on, say with me. I don't care who it is. Homeless person. Drug addict. Prostitute. Gambler. Those folk that some of y'all don't like to sit beside in the church. These are all human beings. In the grace of God that we could come through the doors anyhow. When one loses respect for a fellow human being. Jesus said it is just like committing murder in your heart. When a man or a woman spits in the face of another fellow human being and looks down on that person as a second-class citizen because of the color of their skin, because of the texture of their hair. I've got good hair and you've got bad hair. Foolishness. Oh, stay with me, y'all. That man or woman has a spirit in their heart of being a murderer already. Say amen. I read somewhere that the foundation of the slavery in America was built around disrespect for the individual worth of Africans. Say amen. And some of us have developed that same disrespectful attitude towards one another. Say amen. Because I don't like you. I'm a vegetarian and you're not. Some of us, like the Pharisees, have become self-righteous. Now, I'm generalizing. I'm not. Come on. When we began to look down on our own brothers and sisters because they don't have what we have, forgetting that God has brought us from a mighty long way. When just a few years back, you didn't have enough to rub two together. But now all of a sudden, you're living on Sugar Hill and you have forgotten where you came from. If a convinces himself that the lives of others aren't worth nothing, then the inference here is that it does not matter what happens to that person. Are y'all with me today? Jesus said, don't even become angry enough to commit murder. The Pharisees read this law and not having murdered, they felt that they were righteous enough in their own eyes. But these were the same people who were angry enough to crucify Jesus on Friday and rush home to keep the Sabbath. Come on, say amen. Though they didn't do the dirty work themselves, they were angry enough to plot the murder of hostility, rage, wanting to fight back. 
kill him. Oh, wait a minute, Pastor. I'm not going to kill anybody. Oh, yes, you can. Killing is a terrible sin, but it's a greater sin too because it violates God's command to love. How in the world can you sit there and say you love God whom you've never seen and at the same time hate your brother and sister? Sometimes folk get so angry that they boil up on the inside, almost ready to explode. Physicians tell us that one cannot live swelling anger any more than one can endure a growing tumor. Both in time will be fatal. Say amen out there. Jesus was to show them that murder begins in the heart. The law, what did I say? The law was given to convict, convict convict them of sin. The law was given to reveal their need of a savior. Some folk feel that they don't need a savior and all they have is the law. That's why they walk around here so mad, miserable, mad and don't even know why they're mad. Didn't Jesus already tell you, if you love me? If you love me, conditional, if you love me. Keep my, love is not a set of rules. Stay with me, church. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Who is it? The Holy Ghost. It is the work, I'm trying to set this thing up, listen to me now. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to apply the principles of the law to the heart to show you and be how to live. These folk, rabbis, righteousness as a passport to heaven. But Jesus said, external ceremonies, theoretical knowledge isn't worth a hill of beans. The rabbis, church folk, claim to be holy in their own eyes, but their works had divorced righteousness from religion. Oh, y'all not getting this thing. These kind of folk consider themselves to be the greatest religionists in the world. But the only thing they're doing is hindering their own salvation and being a stumbling block to others just in the way. Men and women may go around here professing the faith in the truth, but if that same religion does not permit it, to go to church and get your name on record, waste your time going to all these meetings, singing in the choir, give all your money, if you're not going to be any different from what you were before you joined the church. Jesus said, I want you to be hot or cold. I don't want to get off on the healthy Holy Ghost. In this passage, it takes up the commandments separately. He explains the depth and the breadth of their requirements. Instead of removing one jot of their force, he is showing the far-reaching principles, come on, come on, of the law. Murder, he said, first exists in the mind. If you let, let hatred find a lodging place in your heart, you are setting yourself up for murder. Come on, say amen out there. Before I continue, before I continue, let me pause here and say, there is a thing called righteous indignation. That is all right. Well, preacher, what do you mean? When I see the name of God being dishonored, I become angry. Say amen out there. When I see the innocent oppressed, I become angry. 
when I see hypocrites and other folk, how to live, I become angry. A righteous indignation stirs up in my soul when I see hate groups burning down the house of God. I become angry. Stay with me now. But when some of become angry at every little thing and we feel at liberty to get angry, we are opening up our hearts for murder. Well, well, just in case you think I'm talking about somebody else, talk to me. All week long, you've made up your mind not to talk to Sister Ed because of something she said to you 20 years ago. Yes, sir. Oh, but when it comes down to reciting the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you have the loudest voice in the church. God isn't even listening to you. Say amen out there. Until you make it right with Sister X. Is it clear? If it's clear, say amen. You've got all of that bitterness. Who do you think you are? You've got to, we've got to get rid of that animosity. Give it to Jesus. And he'll give you a new heart. Jesus put it this way. Verses 23 and 24. If thou bring thy gift to the altar. And there rememberest that thy brother have received there thy gift. Before the altar. And go home. Or wherever you're going. First. First. Be reconciled. Make it right. Make it right with your brother. Then go to the altar and give your gift. Let me make it clear. Once you get in the church and they call for the offering, and you remember that you still have a problem with your brother or sister in the church. It is better for you to go to your brother first, then come and give your offering. We've got to develop a ministry that restores relationships. Come on, say amen. We live in a fractured society. The young against the old. The rich against the poor. Black against the white. My church against your church. My preacher preaches better than your preacher. My choir is better than your choir. And if you have the Holy Ghost, you will be left down here. We've got to develop a ministry to put broken families back together. We've got to learn how to respect one another. Young folk going around here talking about you dissed me. They've got to learn how to respect their elders. Broken relationships can hinder our relationship with God. Did you get that? If you've got a problem, go to your brother or your sister. Go and resolve that problem as soon as possible. We are hypocrites, Jesus. Love God while we hate others. Give me seven minutes. I'm going to take it anyhow. Many of us are zealous in religious service. We sing, shout, even preach. But between them and their brethren, there are things that need to be worked out. God wants you to do all that's in your power to restore harmony. Shame man out there. Until you, how in the world can you come here and receive a blessing? If you have hatred in your heart. Until you do this, God cannot and will not accept any of 
It is easy to say we love God when it doesn't cost us anything more than a weekly attendance at a church service. But the, but the real test of our love for God is how we treat the people right in front of us. Our family members, our fellow believers, our neighbors, husbands and wives not on and come to church and talk about happy Sabbath. What's happy about it? Treat your uh, other folk better than you treat your own children. I've seen it. Oh, Pastor Thompson. Yes, sir. We cannot truly love God while neglecting to love those who were created in his image. Some of us are so mean and cruel and we want to tell people what they should eat and what they shouldn't eat, where they should go, what they shouldn't wear, the 2300 day prophecy. But do the folk know that we love one another? Before I leave this passage, let me say this. Christians, we become part of God's family. Not by yourself. Y'all not getting it. When we become Christians, we become part of God's family with fellow believers as our brothers and sisters. Former drug addicts. Former prostitutes. It is God. Say it. It is God who determines who the family members are. Not us. I read somewhere where Jesus said, Whosoever, whosoever, I don't care if you can trace your roots back to Ellen White. Whosoever, we are simply called to accept them and to love them. Our attitude towards others affect our relationship with God. Three minutes. I'm so glad that Jesus practiced what he preached. Oh yeah. He didn't get angry. Are y'all still with me? Come here, Adam. I sinned. But did you get angry at me? No, no. He could have gotten angry with Adam and killed both of them right there. You got drunk. But, but Lord, I'm not angry at you. Come here. Come here, Noah. Come here, Noah. I love you. Come here, Abraham. You lied, Abraham. Did Jesus get angry? No, sir. Come here, Elijah. Oh, I ran away. I was scared. Did you get angry? No. Come here, Peter. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You denied me three times. Did I get angry? No, sir, disciple. Y'all ran away. Did you get angry? No, sir. Come here, Paul. You stood by and watched my church members die. I didn't get angry, but I changed your name and turned you around and you became a great preacher come on talk to me but I'm so glad come here preacher I was sinking deep in sin sure very deeply stained within sinking to rise no more but the master Oh, I don't want to turn this thing into a testimonial period. But I should walk out there. Some of you can testify what God has done for you. Oh, have mercy on us. I'm so glad. Operates in the opposite direction. He saves from the gut up. Yes, sir. 
He doesn't look at my faults. He sees my needs. He came all the way from heaven down. Y'all not thinking with me. He came all the way from heaven down. He came all the way down. That he might save from the bottom up. Talk to me somebody. I read that he didn't stop at the palace. He came on down to a little humble cottage like some of us have to live in. He didn't stop at the holy city of Jerusalem. He came on down to the ghetto of Nazareth where one of his own disciples said, can any good come out of Nazareth? He didn't stop with the rich, but for our sakes, he became poor. He didn't stop with the loyalties. He came on down to the common people. He didn't stop with those who are beautifully endowed like Absalom of old. He came on down to rotten, degenerate leopards and he made them whole. He didn't stop with the socially elite. He ate with publicans and sinners. He came down. And he won the battle in the flesh. And he said, as I rise, you can rise too. Oh, you better play something on there. I'm going to be here all morning. I'm not preaching anything that I learned in a seminary book. I'm lifting up transcripts out of my own experience. I walked around so long trying to cover up my sins. When I walked around the streets of I didn't even know that I had a mind. I used to sit down to try to read a book and couldn't even concentrate. Empty, restless, forsaken. But then I heard that God has for my guilt. Come on, say amen. God has mercy for my mess. Whoso ever confesses and forsaketh shall have mercy. I don't care where you came from today. I don't care for what you've done. I don't care if you slept in the wrong bed last night. I don't care if you smell like cigarettes or alcohol. You can have God's mercy as soon as you confess he's not angry. I love you. Oh, I got to put this away. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I'm going to pray the Father. And he's going to give you another comforter. Who is this comforter? The Holy Ghost. John 14, 15. Now any sinner can have the Spirit of God with them. A man can walk down the street with his mind on sin. And there's a voice in his ear telling him, don't do it, don't do it. We call it conscience and we call it other things. Of God, the Holy Spirit, with that man trying to keep that man from doing wrong. But on the other hand, only a man or woman who will turn their life over to Jesus only a man or woman who will be converted by the power of Jesus has the spirit in them. Come on, say amen. And every time I want to tell a lie, there's something within that holdeth the rain. Something within all that I know that there's something within. 
Oh, we need to build up our relationships, folks. We need to be more like Jesus. Come on, trio. Y'all supposed to sing another song? Come on up. Come on up. Jesus can fix it. Jesus can do it for you. Nobody but Jesus. Better day after a while, there will be a better day, a better child, there'll be a better day after a while. I'm gonna treat all my troubles in for a lifetime of smile. I forget how hard it's been to run these last few months. And when Jesus says to me, Wow, all the bitter heartache will surely be worthwhile. I'm going to treat all my troubles in for a lifetime of smile. Look at how hard it's been to run these last room balls. And when Jesus says to me, welcome home, my child. Oh, the bitter heart ain't here. Surely be worthwhile. There'll be a better day.